And thank you very much for, uh, for being here uh, this morning. Her Royal Highness, uh, Princess Dina Miret of uh, Jordan, Dr. Kelly Hennen, uh, Doug Webb from UNDP, and distinguished uh, guests, uh, welcome to this uh, vital talk. We are expecting Dr. Tedros. I know that he has uh, a very uh, hectic schedule, so when he arrives, we'll, uh, uh, we'll introduce him. My name is Jose Luis Castro, and I'm the CEO of Vital Strategies, and I welcome all of you to, uh, to this event. We all know that NCDs are the number one cause of death uh, worldwide, and preventing NCDs is essential for ensuring health uh, for all. We are here today to talk about how we can leverage the fiscal policies toward NCD prevention, and especially in low and middle income countries. Um, so I now turn it over to Nina, uh, who will be the moderator for uh, this event. Nina. Good morning in the back. My name is Dina Retro and I'm Director of Policy and Advocacy at the NCD Alliance. Um, the theme for our talk this morning is putting money to work to prevent NCDs. Um, today's talk and all of these vital talks in the series are live streamed and will be available on video at the Vital Strategies website shortly after this event. For those who are watching online, and I understand we have quite a big audience online as well, Welcome. You can share your views with us today using the hashtag VitalTalks uh, to join the discussion, and we'll see you there. Um, for those of you in the room who don't want to be embarrassed, please put your phones on silent in front of our audience. So this morning's session captures what for me has been one of the main themes of this UN General Assembly week. So across all five summits, there's been this one united theme, and that's how do we finance um, the agendas that we want to go towards, that's universal health coverage, action on climate change, progress towards the overall sustainable development goal agenda for 2030, and today's uh, summit theme financing for development. So we're pulling all of this together this morning. We've had commitments made at the very highest level by heads of state and government who've come here for the UN General Assembly, including to universal health coverage. But the work really starts now. I think we've had that message throughout the week. The work starts here. We've got the political declaration. So actually, how do we get there? How are we going to do it? And of course, the funding is at the heart of that discussion. What are our health systems of the future going to really look like? What will they look like? What kind of services and care are they going to offer for people living with non-communicable diseases? How are they going to have a preventative angle to make sure that the demand for those health services isn't something that overwhelms governments and overwhelms the budgets that are available. So we'll kick off this morning with two very short presentations um, from our uh, speakers, two studies, one on the taxation side and one on the incentive side, so this real fiscal perspective. And afterwards, our two presenters will be joined here on the panel um, by our other speakers. So without too much delay, I will introduce our presenters, Dr. Kelly Henning, is a medical doctor and an epidemiologist by background. She currently leads the Global Health Program at Bloomberg Philanthropies. Dr. Henning is going to present on the role of health taxes as effective tools for public health. Uh, and after Kelly, we'll hear from Do Dr. Nandita Murakutla. She is Vice President for Global Policy and Research at Hero Vital Strategies with a background in behavioral economics and will present on economic incentives uh, for health harmful commodities. So I invite, first of all, Kelly to come up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nina. Can you hear me in the back? You hear? Okay, good. Um, just stand over here a little bit. <laughs> See if we can get something going. Um, so I'd like to talk about uh, this new report that Bloomberg Philanthropies supported uh, recently, which is um, really meant to spur some action by ministers of finance around this issue of taxation. Um, to save lives. Uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies has been supporting low and middle income countries to do effective tobacco control for quite some time, since 2007. And one of the main policies that we're supporting is this raising of taxes and raising of price of tobacco products because it is so incredibly effective at reducing tobacco use. And you can see here on the slide on the right, this is just a little example from Colombia of their um, very uh, successful decline in cigarette consumption based on a 54% increase in their uh, tobacco excise tax. 
We have literally dozens of these graphs from dozens of countries which show this type of impact. And we're very um, keen to figure out how we can go from uh, those uh, good pieces of evidence to some real action at national level. So progress is quite slow. It's been um, a, a bit of a slug, I would say, to get this work moving forward. And so when, when Mike Bloomberg became the WHO Global Ambassador for NCDs, we asked ourselves, what could we do to, p to potentially uh, expedite this work? And we came up with the idea of a task force on fiscal policy for health. So in 2018, that task force was convened. And the goal here was to put together high-level persons, experts, from not just health, but also from finance and from development, and to analyze and draw more attention to these fiscal policies. And you can see the members of the task force on the right. It's going to be a little difficult for those of you in the back. But um, Mike Bloomberg and Larry Summers co-chaired this group. Um, Masood Ahmed is an example of Nicola Sturgeon, um, the president of Uruguay, uh, Dr. Vasquez, and so forth. So the idea here was to really try to get some high-level buy-in and some emissaries for this work. So not just to produce a report, but to have this group of people act as <coughs> spokespeople in turn as we, as we moved forward. The task force focused on uh, support for excise tax. There was a lot of debate, what should we talk about here, what should we focus on, and they decided in this first report that excise was where they wanted to begin, and they wanted to broaden beyond tobacco. So this report focuses on not just tobacco, but also on alcohol and sugary beverage consumption. So the report was released in April of 2019, so just about six months ago, and I think um, we've received a lot of positive feedback from national level governments and others about this report, and I, I have to say that my favorite piece of the report or the commentary is really Larry Summers' point, which is if we want to improve global health, we have to tax the things that are killing us. And I think that's really the point that this report tried to drive home. So the report, just in a nutshell, and you can, res you can see this um, very uh, report in detail, as well as the five white papers that were commissioned to support the data that's in the report, on the Bloomberg Philanthropies website. So go to Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Public Health um, tab, and the WHO Global Ambassador area, and all that material is available for you there. Um, but the ta task force very clearly concluded that raising excess on tobacco, alcohol, and sugary beverages will save millions of lives. Um, and as Larry Summers uh, has said many times, is really a no-brainer. Um, the commission analyzed this data in a number of different ways, and I didn't want to put all that material on the slide, but just the overarching piece was that if there was a one-time global tax increase that raised prices of these products, these three areas, by 50%, we would avoid 50 million premature deaths and also raise 20, million, 20 trillion US dollars uh, in additional rev revenue across the globe. So very impactful. Lots of different ways of looking at this data in the actual report, both by tobacco versus alcohol versus sugary beverage, and also by income level. So I think there's a lot of rich information there, and I'm very excited to be able to share it with you today. Thank you. I'm making this presentation today on behalf of Vital Strategies and the MCD Analysis. And my presentation essentially summarizes the tweet that we've released that um, you should all have a copy of in which we summarize how incentivizing unhealthy industries essentially. Okay. Will essentially sicken millions and cost trillions. So, Air pollution caused by fossil fuels, alcohol, tobacco, we know that all of these are preventable causes of NCDs and, excuse me, Uh, you've got the report before you, so uh, I'll use that um, to pivot my conversation. So 
We know that a number of these risk factors are preventable and that they cause immense death and disease. And yet we know that these are incentivized by governments. And that's essentially what the purpose of our report is to highlight. We're calling these incentives perverse because essentially they go against the fundamental interests of society and they place an intense burden on health systems. So in the report, our forthcoming report, and this is an early release of this fuller report, we're essentially calling on this policy incoherence to make the point that on the one hand, we cannot be incentivizing these industries, then bearing the immense health toll and the cost from it, and already strapping a, a, a health system and a, and a health budget that's overstretched. Today's focus is on fossil fuels, but briefs on alcohol and tobacco are forthcoming. So NCDs face a financing gap and a financing crisis. We're well aware of this. We have known that 70% of death and disease is caused uh, is, is a result of NCDs. We know that 7 million deaths um, today annually are caused by air pollution. And we also know that if things continue as they are, this will only increase over time. We've also known that NCDs cost, and they cost an anticipated within the next decade about 47 trillion US dollars just from the five NCDs um, alone, just the top five NCDs alone. And yet NCDs continue to be a low priority, a low political priority, and we're making this point based on financial commitments to NCDs. Government budgets, allocations to NCDs are low, and used as a proxy for political will, less than 2% of donor assistance goes towards NCDs. But at the same time, we know that investment in unhealthy commodities remains high. So for instance, in this brief, we present um, conservative estimates of about $300 billion as pre-tax subsidies for fossil fuels. This in the face of the fact that air pollution costs globally at least $2.7 trillion in terms of health impacts. So essentially in this report, we're making the case that this subsidy to fossil fuels is, is propelling a reliance on an unhealthy polluting source, and it is essentially contributing both to climate change but also to ill health. In our brief, you'll see that we've also described what is the government investment in health. And you'll see that the amount of money that's spent in, um, in health is in no way going to cover the cost of NCDs at large, and even if you look at just air pollution, health impacts, and costs, there is absolutely no way it's going to cover it globally. 50% um, <coughs> of the budget would simply go to attending to the health impacts of air pollution. What's even more shocking, you'll see in our report, that in a number of countries, the cost from air pollution, the cost from the health impacts of air pollution, significantly outweigh entire government expenditure for health. In some instances, that's fivefold. So in sum, we're essentially saying this is unsustainable. Um, the current practice, this inconsistency, on the one hand incentivizing unhealthy products, then having to pay for it out of a strap stretched budget is just simply not sustainable. So we're calling on policy coherence, which we know is fundamental to addressing and preventing NCDs. We're also saying phase out NCDs, but do so while building a narrative around how this is not a common good and that ultimately shifting to social welfare programs is in ultimately um, people's interest and in public health. And fundamentally, fiscal policies work. There's tremendous evidence to show that it does work. So our report calls on governments to use fiscal policies um, to work for preventing NCDs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nandita. Apologies for the loss of the slide, but I understand you all have paper copies on your chair, so hopefully you could follow along. Um, and hopefully there's plenty of material there for your questions. So towards the end of the session, there'll be plenty of time for a Q&A with you, the audience in the room. So we look forward to that. Think on what your questions might be to all of our panelists. And I would encourage you, this week feels like it's already had 17 days in it, right? Yeah. So let, let's be very brief with our questions. Let's be brief with our interventions so we can uh, keep it moving as much as possible and involve as many as you as we can. Okay, I'm going to invite all of our panelists to come up to the front of the room and take your seats. Our additional speakers are Her Royal Highness Princess Dina Mered from Jordan. She is... 
President of the Union for International Cancer Control, USCC. These chairs. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Princess Dina. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody yeah. comfortable? Thank you, Princess yeah. Dina, so much for joining us. And uh, Doug Webb, he leads the HIV Health and Development Team at the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. So we're going to launch into a conversation with our panelists, and then, as I said, plenty of time for all of you to take part. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Kelly, I think I'll start with you, as uh, you've already presented to us. I would like to ask, um, how was this report, how was the task force report received by your target audience? How did you get it into the hands of, of finance ministers, the people you want to make different decisions, and, and what kind of feedback did you get from them? Um, the, the task force report actually exceeded our expectations. We posted it on the Bloomberg website, which we don't normally do, and we got several thousands, a thousand, um, not just clicks, but downloads of the full report. So we felt like that was a, a positive indicator. The uh, members of the task force have been very active in trying to promote the, the documents. Um, um, <clears throat> Minister Cardenas, the former Minister of Finance of Colombia, has actually um, attended a number of events for us. Uh, the World Bank has put out a couple of blogs, uh, including uh, at the G20. Um, and the, uh, the, the World Health Assembly had a special session, side session about the report as well that was led by Minister of Health from Norway, who's a member of the task force. So we feel like it's going quite well. Um, we'd like to do more. We'd like to hear from folks in the audience if there are ideas about how we might do more. But yes, we're very, we're feeling very positive. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned um, the Minister of Health in Norway, Ben Hoyer. He said in an event earlier this week with finance ministers, where he was sat on a panel directly with them, taxation of unhealthy commodities such as alcohol, tobacco, and sugar treat beverages is the best business case, I'm reading this because it was so good, the best business case that ministers of finance will ever see. I mean, this is, yeah, we had a great session that was hosted by World Heart Federation earlier this week. If, Kelly, you meet a Minister of Finance later today inside the UN General Assembly in a elevator, what would be your pitch? It would a little bit depend on which Minister of Finance I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, you know, these are these taxes are, these excise taxes are indeed, um, are indeed a best buy for health. And it is true that we raise revenue, and it is true that we need revenue, but the point is that we can improve health. And um, that in itself is a, a big cost savings. And so I think this idea, when we talk to Ministers of Health, they don't really always want to talk about revenue. Sometimes they want to talk about what's the health impact. And I think that's um, important to keep in mind. Okay. Um, Princess Dina Merrick, coming to you. Um, for most people in the world, they're still paying for health care when they need it out of their own pockets. And that drives families into poverty. And, you know, from the perspective of, of middle income countries and lower income countries, can you give us some examples of how this sort of thinking has been rolled out to support health care? Well, thank you very much, Nina. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the session. Actually, um, some countries, we've seen now great examples of really some enlightened leaders who are, you know, uh, taking on the evidence and actually implementing tax on alcohol, sugar, salt, like Mexico, Thailand, Brazil, and many other low and middle income countries. So that's really good. So the evidence is there. And thanks to your report, the numbers are Certainly, as an example, the Philippines imposed 13% on uh, sugar beverages. And there was a modeling done in, in one study and to see how much, you know, in the long term this would uh, impact a decrease in consumption. And, and it says um, that the tax could potentially generate total healthcare savings of $627 million. Uh, over 20 years, and per annum would raise 8.3 million. Mm -hmm. So this is money those countries wouldn't have had. And but what I would like, you know, a lot of the times the word taxes. <coughs> I know in America taxes is the big thing. Everybody says taxes. <laughs> the, 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 the president who reduces taxes and so on. Taxes is the big thing. Certainly in my country as well. Recently the government has had to really levy a lot of taxes because of uh, due to economic hardship and so on. So the word taxes gets everybody tense. And I really would like to reframe the name because sometimes it's called sin taxes or excise taxes. Why don't we call them the good taxes? Because we need to reframe. Labeling is important, you know. 
Um, and if we can use a new name or a new frame, become at least you open the door to say, hey, this is for you. Because half the time it's the very people, uh, they might be the number one enemy to the government who wants to impose a syntax. And they start to say, oh, you're limiting my personal freedom. Mm -hmm. and so I think that's, you touch on, on, on a really important point, how, how do governments, how do ministers communicate this to their public? Because you're saying to them, okay, we want to put a tax on something that you didn't have a tax on before, or we want to gradually raise a tax as a tax escalator, or strip back in subsidy, as Nandita was saying, this is something that people are going to hit, you know, they're going to feel a hit in their pockets. So how can we, in your experience, how can we better engage with the public to say, you know... Take your time to explain at every municipality go grassroots. Typically, our government maybe just do a press release, which nobody knows, yeah? Um, they don't take their time, they don't speak layman language, and so immediately they get pushed back. And who's better at spreading the misinformation? It's usually the And we've had just an example right now here with our fight against e-cigarettes. And the misinformation about you know, they made it, the industry sent the misinformation because the country, you know, they wanted now to put stringent standards. So they made it out, the industry, that because um, the traditional cigarette has gone down, because some, you know, unfortunate minister said, we've lost money, people are smoking less because they had to increase the taxes because obviously it works when you increase the price. So then suddenly it became, <laughs> we're going to annoy the government so we're not going to smoke the traditional, we're going to smoke e-cigarettes, not knowing it's the same people who own the same thing. So misinformation, they're usually better than us at misinformation, and usually governments are not good at really laying the context and working at it for some time so that when they give that policy, they will not have pushback from the very people who are going to be the beneficiaries. So this is important. For example, the Jordan example about uh, fuel, I think did somebody did you mention it. Uh, apparently, I didn't know it was the first time I hear it, that Jordan removed subsidies uh, from fossil fuels, reduced it to something like 0.4. So that's great, it's great news. Usually the cynics in my country would think, oh, that's the World Bank making us do all the things that uh, removing subsidies on bread, this, that. So it's nothing good about it. Um, and so obviously they didn't benefit from this wonderful thing because apparently they used that extra money to give it for social security to help poor people with extra heating costs and so on. They didn't benefit from this act. You know, I didn't hear about it. When you told me, oh, Jordan, we're doing this, I never heard about it. And I'm very in tune with what's going with health issues and so on. So lack of communication yeah. is key to really remind people that these are the good guys, the good taxes. Thank you very much. So uh, in talk, talking about cutting through misinformation and providing a solid evidence base and the case to governments for going ahead with this, I'm going to turn to Doug from UNDP. Um, investment cases is something that you develop with the colleagues within the U other UN agencies, the WHO. Can you tell us a bit more about the sort of investment cases you've been developing and, and what you've presented to the government? Good morning, everyone. So within, we've done with WHO and the Framework Convention and Tobacco Control Secretariat around 25 national investment cases on non-communicable diseases and tobacco control. We have requested to do about 65, which is quite tough for our, our team of about five people. Um, so we go in and we look at local data with the local government people, um, and this has really increased the ownership. Um, and what we're finding from these cases um, developed with the Ministry of Finance, with the Ministry of Health, is the costs of the current disease burden, essentially, from NCDs and tobacco. Uh, Georgia, 2.4% of GDP per year just from tobacco. Um, Jordan, I'm sorry, 6% of GDP per year uh, just from tobacco, which is about three times the global average. El Salvador, every pack of cigarette smoked is about, it costs about nine dollars uh, to the El Salvadorian economy. Um, and these costs are not just health costs, not just health care costs, they're actually costs to the economy particularly. And we're finding if you measure indirect costs in terms of absenteeism, presenteeism, and cost of the social welfare system, it's about 80% of the costs 
are actually derived indirectly and not to the, to the, the health system uh, itself. So we then calculate the returns on the investment of implementing the convention or doing some of the NCD best buys. And this is where the figures get quite interesting. Uh, you see a range of around, for non-communicable diseases, about 1 to 1 to 50, uh, one, 1 to 50 returns um, over quite a short period of time. Um, the most extraordinary one we saw was the tobacco tax in Jordan. Um, implemented effectively, you get a return of 1 to 1,547 by uh, 2033. One, I've got it written here. One to 1,547. This is what our economists are trying to tell us once we go and dig around. Um, so we find these extraordinary returns on investment, and we throw those back at government, at parliamentarians, legislators, policy makers, the general public, everybody who's interested, and say, are you happy to accept this current loss that you're experiencing? Or do you want to invest in prevention? And we find that that really does, when you put it in a moral landscape of what societies are prepared to tolerate, you then have a meaningful conversation. So we found that the Ministry of Finance, because it talks in these terms, and it's being besieged with return on investment analyses all the time from everywhere, you then start talking their language. And the Ministry of Health actually starts feeling empowered to engage in an area where it didn't feel um, potent in this conversation. So we found it kicking up the dust very, very handy. Wonderful. Okay. This is, I mean, that figure, 1,000, 1 to 1,500. I hope it's right now. Yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, return on, the, the return on investment and the payback period is about 15 years. Yeah. 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 So the return on investment and the payback period, you know, the you mentioned before, um, policy in the era. Clearly, there's a situation at the moment where we're even subsidizing things that are killing us. Not only are we not taxing the things that are killing us, subsidizing them to, to a massive tune, especially when it comes to fossil fuels. Um, we touched on it already. This is something, fuel tax is the prices of the pump when you go and fill up your car or you want to travel. This is something that people feel very keenly. Um, can you tell us how you see that from your perspective? We've looked at how far stripping back those subsidies might go into helping us realize universal health coverage. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? It's an important question, especially in the context of economic recessions everywhere in the world and this fear about taking away something from people. People don't like things taken away, and we know that that's a, that's a trigger um, for political anxiety. So I'm going to build on what the speakers before me already said. Uh, one is changing the narrative. You clearly what a number of um, examples show us and a number of experiences show us is people care about health. It's just that they're not thinking about it. And when a policy is presented with short-term gains and with immediate returns, the longer-term gains are lost and the longer-term costs are lost. So it really is about building that narrative, communicating that narrative, and making clear where that shift will go, how that investment will matter, because fundamentally, no matter where in the world you are, people do care about health, and they do care about the, the well-being of um, generations that follow. So I think the Jordan example that we do have in our report, and we do have a few other examples in our report, really underscore this, that when these subsidies are phased out, um, they're done so carefully invest elsewhere so that the good of this is made palpably clear. Thank you. I mean, uh, are there any economists in the audience? Pure economists? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, pure, pure economists would tell us we don't like earmarking, right? We don't like to have pocket case revenues for one specific thing. We would love to, if we're going to raise taxes on something else, we'll, we'd prefer to reduce the tax burden on enterprise, on, on uh, work, for example. I'm sorry, I didn't realize um, so I'd like to come back to our panel and ask that question. Is this, is this the core, is this something that we need to shift? Is this something that, um, to engage the general public, actually earmarking is something that we should be recommending? I love earmarking, because what happens in our, you know, when I was Director General of the Kingdoms and Cancer Foundation, you know, you go to the ministry, even for them to pay our service bills, because they send people to be treated at the centre, there isn't a line. Uh, at the budget, so everybody, all the hospitals has to go and see the health minister 
and it's like a very unclear thing. There isn't any line for insecure. There is nothing. And I think, in general, for those countries who don't actually trust that their governments are going to improve their public health system or give them quality care and be uh, equitable about it, in the beginning, we need a market. They will not accept those taxes unless you say, this is going for one, two, three, this is how it's going to benefit. I am all for it, at least until it becomes a habit uh, and, and people start trusting again and actually feeling the services, actually feeling it. Uh, I'm all for it because otherwise it goes into one big hole uh, in a budget that we don't know where it is going. Um, economists would tell you that hypothecating is an inefficient use of money. But this isn't about economics, this is about politics. And when the industry comes to the Ministry of Finance and says don't raise taxes on these products because it will affect the poor people more because they consume the most, why are you being so cruel? It then becomes quite an important political gesture to, um, to actually start earmarking towards social services that benefit the poorest. And we've done analyses in Myanmar and China showing exactly how that earmarking would reduce inequalities. And in a political environment where that has capital, it then becomes an extremely important public relations exercise. So we found that whatever the underlying economics, you can push back against industry, and push back against regressivity arguments, and actually win public favor for tax increase. I mean, this is, this is always the hit back, isn't it, from um, those who would be affected by taxation or stripping back the subsidies that it would be regressive. But I think now these are in terms of fossil fuel subsidies and found that subsidizing has been progressive and that it's at the least benefit for the poorest people and the biggest benefit for, for those who can already afford it and that we're the best off in society. I know broadly, and I know that uh, the World Health Federation support this week has made a similar point. I think the Bloomberg Philanthropies report also makes this point. It depends on what we're going to, how we define what is progressive. and. Ultimately, if we don't account for these externalities, whether it's to the environment or to health, then the costs are really not true costs, but they're an artificial cost. Um, I was also very interested in this language around common goods for health. I was very excited to hear a lot of that at, um, you know, in, at side events uh, over this past week, the notion that it is the job of governments to correct market inequalities. That isn't being a nanny state, because it isn't a level playing field. And unless there are corrections, we're not giving people a fair chance. Exactly. So, yeah, achieving that policy coherence from what at the moment is a very incoherent system, in fact, it's, it's very important to call that out. Um, we've talked so far about national government level. And Kelly, I want to come to you because working with mayors and working with cities is a very important part of Bloomberg Philanthropy's mission. Um, the mayor of Barcelona, uh, Ada Calau, was here this week and she was speaking about the role of cities and she was also calling for stripping back the fossil fuel subsidies. So can you tell us a bit more about the role you see for cities and men at that level of government? So uh, as, you, as you point out, We're, we're interested in mayors. We have a lot of connections with mayors. Um, the, the difficulty we find sometimes is jurisdictional. So does the mayor actually have jurisdiction over this particular policy that we're interested in? Um, but what we do like about mayors is that they're immediately responsible to their citizens. So they are held accountable, and they are um, also praised if they do uh, a good job for health. So um, that's the balance that we're trying to figure out. And we have uh, a partnership for healthy cities right now um, in 260 plus cities around the world. And I'm actually quite astonished at the progress. So I, I think we do really, really want to catalyze and support city mayors to do more. Okay. Um, I'm going to come to the audience for questions in just one second. First of all, I'm going to uh, go over to Doug. There was something extremely interesting in my view launched this week, and that's the SDG3 Global Health Action Plan from across 12 agencies of, of the UN, WHO, World Bank. UNDP, many others. There is a big focus, a very welcome focus in there on fiscal measures and on commercial determinants of health. There is, yes. We fought very hard um, to keep that phrase in there. Um, just the Global Action Plan on SDG 3, essentially, is uh, the 12 global health organizations looking to basically improve working relationships, increase efficiencies, and there's no point in us lecturing governments about incoherence. 
when the big global health organizations are behaving exactly in that manner. Um, that's, so that's what this is trying to achieve at country level specifically. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about work process and efficiency gains and reducing transaction costs and dull things like that. But the commercial determinants, we, we pushed very hard to keep it against some member states wanting to take it out, is because the commercial, the relationship between the private sector and the public sector has been a massive lacuna, I think, for the UN system over the last 20 years. And there's no point in us trying to look at NCDs if we do not take this head on. And governments are desperate for help in terms of how to partner, manage, legislate health farming products. So I'm delighted it stayed in there um, and we need to start moving on it very quickly. Okay, thank you very much. Right, your panelists is gonna pause for just a moment because I just had word that Dr. Tedros has arrived. Keynote, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. So we're going to pause. So everybody, um, just keep your questions in mind for a moment. Your panelists will be back after we've heard from Dr. Tedros. So I'm going to invite uh, Jose Luis Castro back up to make introductions for you, Dr. Tedros. Thanks. <laughs> Dr. Tedros, since his uh, election as Director General, has been a very strong advocate for NCDs, their prevention, and um, we are delighted to have him uh, in this vital talk uh, here today. So without uh, further delay, I turn over to you. Sorry, we're working from another email. I think we're a bit late. <laughs> Apologies for that. Uh, Your Royal Highness, Jose, um, Kelly, Tom, your colleagues and friends. First of all, I would like to extend my thanks to the Vital Strategies and Jose for organizing this event and for your commitment to our fight against non-communicators. I would also like to recognize Princess Tina uh, for her fabulous work on non-communicators, particularly on cancer. And my thanks to also Kelly for her work at Bloomberg Scientific on implementing policies like prevent NCDs and reports that was my Alexander, who is with us, global ambassador for NCDs. Ah, not working? Okay, some better. This has been a landmark week for global health. On Monday, the world leaders endorsed the most important and comprehensive health agreement in history, the political declaration on universal health coverage. The world is unifying behind a simple but powerful idol. No one should get sick and die simply because they cannot access or cannot afford the health services they need. For those of you who were at the meeting, we heard a recurring theme. Country after country emphasized the fundamental importance of strong primary health care for achieving UHC. This was music to my ears. For too long, too many countries have spent too much of their health budgets on managing diseases in tertiary and secondary care. We must make a critical shift to promoting health and preventing diseases at the primary health care level. At least 80% of health needs can be met through primary care, as you know. This is particularly true for non-communicable diseases. NCDs continue to be the leading cause of global mortality 
responsible for 71% of all deaths each year. There are innovative mechanisms that countries can use to generate sustainable funding for health. For example, increasing taxes on tobacco, alcohol, and sugary drinks can help to improve health while generating revenue that can be reinvested in health systems. WHO has published a list of proven and cost-effective interventions for the prevention and control of NCDs. The menu of best advice provides countries with guidance on which interventions provide the most bang for their buck. Last year, we also released the NCD Global Business Plan, detailing for the first time the returns on investment for every dollar spent to implement these measures. But the best investments countries make is in primary health care with an emphasis on promoting health and preventing diseases. To make this shift, WHO is calling on all countries to increase their investment in primary health care by at least 1% of GDP, either through new investments, reallocating funds, or both. Some countries, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, will continue to need targeted support from international community in line with their national priorities but most countries can afford these investments with domestic resources. That's why we say that fundamentally health is a political <coughs> choice. And the question for most countries is not whether it's a choice they can afford to make, it's whether it's, it's whether it is they can afford not to. Uh, maybe one um, couple of issues uh, I would like to add. Uh, on non communicable diseases, uh, you know, the major uh, uh, problems, and one thing we're, we're doing or focusing on uh, is the uh, hypertension, is vital strategies. When we first discussed this now, he was telling me something I don't forget. Uh, globally, there are 1.2 billion people with hypertension, and only 200 million managed while a billion. Walking bonds, as you call them, is 1.4 or 1.4, so 200 billion managed, 1.2 billion <coughs> walking bonds. And the solution simple, it's just providing at household level, person or at individual level, uh, the support they need. And this, can, this is very affordable in many countries, by the way. <coughs> so the reason I'm saying this is there are practical solutions to some of the major problems. And this is a huge problem, but the solution is at hand. So we should start from there. NCD management is very expensive. Look, cancer treatment, or you know, with someone with cardiovascular problem, for surgery. Of course we should do that. But if we're not serious about hypertension, which is something at hand, I don't think we will be serious about the uh, the most expensive one. Of course, we should do both, but we need to show that you know uh, we're starting what we can, and that's a very uh, good uh, example, you know, which is very uh, concrete. And the other maybe thing I'd like to add is on NCD management, especially on the expensive interventions, we will need financing. So the one person who said is for primary health care, health promotion is prevention. And then, of course, taxing tobacco, taxing alcohol, taxing sugar. We can mobilize resources that can be used for the health sector, but it will not be enough, especially in some countries. So what additional innovative financing can we have to address those, those gaps, to treat cancer in countries that they cannot really afford? So what kind of global support and what kind of uh, global uh, financing mechanism we have. I think that's, that's important. And one thing we have been uh, planning to do this year, which we couldn't, and hopefully we'll do it next year, is to address some of the challenges we're facing, having um, a coalition of uh, leaders with the same uh, commitment would be really important to mobilize. And we had actually identified some that were willing to, 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 to be champions. And because of um, some problems, we couldn't do it uh, 
of this year. The reason I'm raising this is having a political commitment and using those uh, political commitments visible that we know mobilizing them could help us to mobilize others to increase awareness so countries can give it more attention. We can see a deficit of awareness. I don't think that many know about NCD's contribution to 71% of global burden of mortality now. It's a crisis, and I think that has to be known, and the political commitment at the highest level will uh, change the tide, and we need to have a strong political commitment, and I hope we can make it happen next year. And with Bloomberg as a really major player, I think, uh, uh, a person very passionate about this from, from here, from this, from here. So, I just wanted to say in the last part that the picture would really uh, work in, with you in any way possible. And one thing we are changing here is our, our engagement of private sector, which has very often some problems, um, as you know, and um, uh, we're trying to uh, engage private sector, because uh, you know there is the engagement challenges of some conflict of interest, or some people say risk, but you, you cannot avoid engagement because there is risk. You have to manage the risk. Your focus should be on achieving the goal. So engaging the private sector is a must, and that's what we're trying to do. With the food industry, we have agreed, and they gave us a written commitment to end trans fat use by 2023. So we hope they will abide by that, or honor their, their pledge. But this is a result of engaging them. Of course, when we discussed about salt, we discussed about sugar, we discussed about saturated fat, it was not as easy as the trans fat. At least they're lining up now with trans fat elimination, which is positive. Then we need to continue the dialogue on the others. And the reason I'm bringing private sector in the end is it's a very sensitive issue for that issue. As you know, many colleagues believe that this is a risky area. We bring the petition at this. But you cannot disengage because of risk. You have to engage, but manage the risk or manage the conflict of uh, interest. And in SDGs, as you know, it's the contribution of the government, the private sector, the civil society, of all that can help us to achieve SDGs. It's not by choosing or what you call picky, cherry picking, that we can achieve SDGs, especially in terms of partnership. The partnership of all players is, is key. So with that, thank you. The mic uh, is working now. <laughs> <laughs> Collaborating. Thank you so much. Dr. Tedros, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for reiterating again that we are in an NCD crisis and that we actually have a pretty strong toolbox of solutions from the WHO set of best buys and for reiterating that in the case of trans fats and the replace action package, we know this is working really well. Um, right, it is time for Q&A with the audience. So I'm going to invite our panelists to come back up again, please. Uh, Princess Dina, Dr. Henning, Dr. Murugutla and uh, Doug Webb. Thank you very much, make yourselves comfortable. I want to reiterate that fiscal policies, we've talked about tax, we've talked about tracking back health harmful subsidies, these are only part of the picture. Um, and what triggers me to raise something else is uh, a presence of somebody in the front of the room, Dr. Bronwyn King. So we have um, also the power of the financial markets and divestment movements like with uh, Tobacco Free Portfolios campaign to move financial markets at the same time. The organization I work for, NCD Alliance, um, together with IISD, which is the International Institute for Sustainable Development, has launched a, a brand new study just yesterday called Burning Problems, Inspiring Solutions. I have some copies, or you can find it online, of course, which is about the learnings, both from the tobacco control movement, but also from the environmental, climate change, and air pollution control movements, what they can learn from each other. And divestment, um, from, for example, tobacco portfolios is just one of those examples. So I wonder, Dr. King, if you could come in and tell us a little bit more about your campaign. 
Thanks so much. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to make a comment because I think that. Oh, okay. Thanks. I think that um, there's an issue that sits almost in between the issues that have been discussed on the panel. In that, on one hand, you have subsidies going to these industries that make products that kill us. And then on the other hand, we're saying we need money to finance um, health and to finance the fight against NCDs. In addition, we need to be aware that most governments today, either through their sovereign wealth funds or public pension funds or public insurance agencies, are in fact investing money in these companies that make products that kill us. So when it comes to our work at Tobacco Free Portfolios, while we spend a lot of our time working with the corporate sector, so we work with big banks and insurance agencies um, and fund managers and ask them to reconsider tobacco and instead of investing in tobacco and financing tobacco, we ask them to stop that. But another really important element is work with government, so work with finance ministers and asking them about policy coherence because most finance ministers, I hate to say it, they don't even know that we have the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. They don't even know it exists. But what they also don't know is that there are a couple of provisions in that treaty that specify that if your government signed and ratified the treaty, sovereign wealth funds and all public run money is meant to be tobacco free. There are 65 sovereign wealth funds in the world that belong to countries that have signed and ratified the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and only eight of them have gone tobacco free. So the vast majority of our sovereign wealth funds in the world are currently investing our money, that's the public's money, in tobacco, and that's just tobacco. So I'd love to know what the panelists think about where we can improve the discussions with finance ministers to let them know that in fact, they need to be thinking about these issues. I'll take some more questions from the audience. Can I have a show of hands? The economist in the back, I picked on you before, so yes, please. My question is, what role can the right investments from the private sector support these NCD efforts with the right financial structures? What I'm talking about here is an instrument known as outcomes-based financing, where we're working with a series of pension funds, sovereign wealth funds in Australia, Asia, and Europe, who collectively manage $250 billion in assets. And so, for example, in India, we're working with a series of state governments to invest $200 million in the next two years, where we fund the upfront costs of strengthening primary health care and digital health with Stanford Medical School to prevent NCDs through community worker-led interventions. But then what you do is you securitize the derived savings, which the government state health insurance schemes receive, and you share those savings with them. But this, we think, can be quite a powerful tool to unblock a lot of private sector capital coming into it. I mean, we've now got commitments from these groups to invest a billion dollars across India, Indonesia, Thailand within the next three years. But I think that's really just scratching the tip of the surface and it builds on what's been done. So I'm keen to understand how this can complement the efforts being made and how this sort of supports and strengthens the NCD prevention agenda. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the science um, of impact plans for public health is really in its very early stages. Uh, we're often talking about investments in sort of the technology, the phones and the drones approach. But a lot of the, the investments and the innovations I'm looking at are, are, are things like tobacco control investment bonds. I mean, UNDP has piloted, or, uh, actually done a viability study in Zambia of moving tobacco farmers to alternative crops. And the returns are in the region of about one point one to one to seven, one to seven in terms of returns over a few years. But selling that is proving very difficult because the Ministry of Agriculture shrugs its shoulders because it's in the pockets of the industry. And then who? So where is the value in that? So we're looking for people who value those returns when they're not immediately politically um, applicable in a, in, a, in a country like Zambia. So there's a massive opportunity in impact bonds once we can define what the inputs are and the returns are. It's a huge area of work we need to do. Very early, thank you for saying that if wants to come in on this. So I'll, I'll try to address both questions and points. Um, again, I'm going to tee up our upcoming report. And to say, in this early brief, we've talked about subsidies in the context of fossil fuels. 
our fuller report, in fact, will look at this more widely because you're right, incentives are not just in the form of subsidies, but there are a vast range of incentives that we really need to look at. So um, alcohol, alcohol is an area in which we're examining this issue and it's somewhat, I, I don't want to give too much away, so if you'll allow me to keep some of that for later. Um, the shocking investments in alcohol and shocking promotion of alcohol that really does need, um, need to be addressed. Um, I won't venture into uh, trying to make an economics-based argument, but just from a behavioral science perspective, two factors we know affect NCDs and the, the use of unhealthy commodities. It's really down to access and price because people don't really know the true cost of what they consume. This externality is not captured either in the form of communication in an ecosystem or within the price of a product. So really they don't have the information they need. And then access is fundamental an issue. If healthy options are not available and they're not the default, then that is in fact part of the problem. So that there, is a, there is a case for incentivizing healthier alternatives. I'm gonna to come to the next question from the audience. Okay, I can see three, four. Right, hold on, Elaine, please. Hi. Um, it's an NZ talking about the canning. We heard Dr. Tedros mention sugar, salt, trans fats, and tobacco. He didn't talk at all about fossil fuels. And this is obviously the new issue you're picking up on now and a cutting edge one, I think, for the health community to tackle. What policy steps do you need to take to really get this more centrally on agendas such as WHO's? It's a very tough one, I think. Um, I'm just wondering if you can etch out what you see as a vision for, for tackling this more centrally in the health here. Yeah, so it, it's a really good question. You know, Bloomberg Plant, because we have a, an entirely separate team devoted to environment, and uh, they're very focused on fossil fuels. And we have a lot of collaboration with the public health team, and we look for these uh, these areas of overlap and areas of complementary complementariness. It's going to be quite difficult, actually. Um, so I think we haven't quite figured that all out. Um, I did sit through a very interesting session yesterday <coughs> at the Bloomer Global, Global Business Forum on biodiversity and was so struck by how it really is a public health issue as well. And the world, the word public health never came up in that entire discussion. So there's a, I don't have an answer for you, but I totally agree with you that there's much more we can be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really think, you know, I really would like to reiterate what Dr. Petra said. There is a deficit of, of awareness and information, especially by the public. That's, that's, the, that's our, you know, so all these wonderful tools like impact bonds, uh, the taxes and so on, in our countries they will fall flat because then it's only one person, which is the Minister of Finance, who is in a room quite nicely with no any opposition who would say no. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and I've seen it now, you know, they were about to uh, swing by some really lag standards for e-cigarettes. And we really, joined together, all of us, the NGOs, and really worked extremely hard. And my KPI was, I know we cannot win the battle, because in, uh, tobacco is highly infected in Jordan. However, my KPI was to make it really difficult. I'm going to annoy them. And we are winning slowly by slowly. And then, first they put me in a committee, and then I found that if you're in a committee, it's not a good thing, because then you really can't speak while the committee is there. <laughs> so we all did a big walkout, and it was so good to do a walkout and be part of the resistance, you know? <laughs> we did a walkout, and I said, I'm not gonna be in any committee. I want to be free on social media <laughs> to talk about them and so on. So I think bringing the public at the same level of information, this is our big thing. That's how why we don't have pressure group because we don't know, we don't know. And like Bronwyn said, the health minister has no idea that he signed the FCPC. We, we told him, I said, I said, he's my friend, I said, you have signed the FCPC, Jordan has, and we were of the first, may I add, as well. And you're breaking the law. They don't know that. Nobody knows that, by the way. So there is no opposing um, information. And I would also like to bring about the fact about the engagement that Dr. Delta spoke about. I always felt that it's too much this sanctimonious approach. Don't talk to this and don't talk to the private sector. We don't live in a saint world, after <laughs> all. And I like his idea that you have to manage the risk very well. And certainly, you can really manage it by them not influencing policy. 
And I would say as a proud ambassador also of tobacco-free portfolios, is the fact how they've engaged a lot of the top finance people. They had no idea because it became so default, the whole thing that the funds they invest in, they had no idea that they were investing in tobacco. When Brom, like the same way Brahman didn't know, they didn't know, they inherited it. And so when they knew, and suddenly they divested, how many? Three? Oh, now there's, well, the initiative we launched last year at, um, at UN headquarters, um, it's called the Pledge, the Tobacco Free Finance Pledge. And there are currently 122 signatories that control 7.5 trillion US dollars. Yeah, they divested from tobacco. Simply by the three women, Yes, they are beautiful and blonde. That did not have those meetings, but they digested. So there is a lack of information. I want to grab a couple more questions. We're very pushed for time, so I'm going to take three very quick questions at the same time. Um, Kelsey, gentlemen in blue, with your hand up, and then gentlemen on the side. So I'm going to take them all in one go, please, and then put them to our panel. Kelsey, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, okay, you go first. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Yori. I'm from Cameroon. Um, I really want to know what is the best approach that we can take in order to address, uh, make sure that the resources that we get at the end of the day are being directed to health. Because um, if my statistics are good, in Africa, about 23% of the health body is in Africa. And just about 1% of all the health expenses you know, are directed to Africa. And secondly, in my country, there's been a recent increase in uh, taxes, you know, on uh, tobacco and alcohol, you know, and even the sizes of the bottle has been reduced, but yet um, the consumption rate is still increasing. So do we keep increasing taxes in order to raise, you know, revenue? And what do we think at the end of the day? Are we not going to send out these uh, industries out of the market? Thank you. Kelsey Armstrong, the Lunch from the World Heart Federation. Thanks to the panel, and thanks, Nina, for mentioning our event on Monday. A duck was there. It was wonderful. We managed to have two ministers of finance that we brought to the high-level meeting on universal health coverage that day. But it wasn't easy, and unfortunately, despite this amazing panel we've had this morning, we don't have any representatives from ministries of finance here. So my question is, what do we need to do to start walking the walk and stop talking the talk about better engagement with ministries of finance? I mean, do we need a Greta Thunberg of health? Do we need a global fund for UHC? What is it going to take to make this into action? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, pass the mic. Back a couple of rows. There you go, Dora. And then I'll put that to the panel. Thank yeah, you very it's much. all about uh, them. You're right. I'm Issa Ali from Ghana, speaking for the Global Co Police Alliance and West Africa Co Police Alliance. Yes, uh, my concern is this. Uh, within the African setting, we know we have a lot of developmental challenges and aspects mm -hmm. of priorities. And looking at most of the global documents, they are more or less uh, based on voluntary aspects. So we are looking at a situation that if we want to address the issue of alcohol harm, which is part of the NCD, we believe that we need a binding mechanism. Because if you have the binding mechanism, as civil society, we can insist and push our government to do what we want to do. But without a binding mechanism, most of the documents, like even the SDG, the global, uh, target, you know, if you go to them to invest the money, they will say, oh, this is from, it's not, it's optional. So uh, when we have the money, we'll do it. So we can raise money from sugar tax and those things, but if we don't have a compelling mechanism to push government to do it, they will not do it. So we need to also consider other mechanisms such as a binding mechanism. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, I'm going to put this quick fire to our panelists. Um, Dr. Henning, would you like to take the question on uh, finance ministers. So Michael Bloomberg, he is the WHO ambassador for NCD. How can he get the ear of finance ministers and how do we make what we have this week with two finance ministers in the room, how do we make this the default when we talk about health? Yeah, so um, the task force on fiscal policy for health had several finance ministers on it. And we asked that question actually, how do we get more of these folks involved? They really want to hear from each other. They really didn't have that much interest in hearing from health. They really wanted to hear <coughs> from finance, and they really wanted to hear from economists. Um, and uh, some of these other international groups that are very focused on. Um, and we have actually a, a collaboration with the World Bank, with um, Inter-American Development Bank, and some others to try to get in the door. But I think we have to really think about partnering outside of the health sphere in order to get to the ear of those ministers. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, we had a question about the, uh, low income. 
country context? How do we make sure that the revenues really do go to shoring up health systems? So, uh, WHO tell us that it's about 40% of the money in the health sector which is wasted. Right. So let's not have this idea that we need more money. We need to spend the money that we've got uh, far better uh, reducing wastage and not just about better targeted invent uh, interventions. The second point is we need to start making I think, bad policies more difficult to implement. And again, we don't focus enough on the decision making. So there's investments that are needed, which have political capital expenditure, not just fiscal expenditure, in higher transparency, better managed conversations across government to look at these knowledge deficits, and a better legislation and oversight environment. That's what our focus is on. <coughs> and uh, the last question was on alcohol, and I suppose all I would say is Nandita and I are working on a brief on alcohol subsidies, so watch this space. Uh, we know 2020 at WHA is going to be a big year on alcohol, so uh, certainly we're working with many of you to make sure that we get a more sensible policy coherent response uh, to that commodity as well. Um, with regret, I'm going to have to wrap up because we need to liberate the room. Thank you very much uh, to everybody for joining us, both here and online. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to have more questions. I think to wrap up, we've heard about the effectiveness and efficiency of economic instruments for health. Uh, particularly for NCD prevention, um, including taxation on those health-harming commodities that we talked about, fossil fuels, tobacco, alcohol, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, junk food, and so on. And we've heard that there is massive untapped potential because these instruments are very rarely taken up compared to what we can achieve from them. There are double dividends that we can still grab onto, even triple dividends, so reduction of the NCD burden, reduction of the costs imposed on our health systems, liberation of, of revenues or opportunities to reduce tax burdens in other areas. I want to leave you with um, a quote from an op-ed that I read in the Financial Times yesterday. Uh, three gentlemen wrote, likewise sin taxes levied on products harmful to health, tobacco, alcohol, uh, highly sugared drinks, can make a valuable contribution. This is about achieving UHC in Africa. They have a double benefit of suppressing consumption of harmful products and providing incremental government revenues. The gentlemen that wrote that are uh, Seth Barkley from Gavi, Peter Sands from the Global Fund, and Mohamed Ali Pati from uh, GFF Global Financing Facility. So, they're also on our side. I think this, that for me was at least new to see that argumentation from them to talk about tax on health harmful commodities. So I want to leave that with you as something to mull over. I think that's been the real value of this week that we've talked across sectors, we've met each other, uh, and we've started a dialogue. And as has been reiterated this week, we take it from here. So I want to say thank you again to Vital Strategies for hosting us today. Um, hashtag Vital Talks. I'm sure the, the conversation will continue and an inspiring end to your week. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Thank you to Dr. Tedros. Thank you, Jose Luis. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.